أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب قلوب العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد Our dear viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh In our previous episode, we spoke about the persecution, house arrests of companions that would preach the words and traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi and also the burial and the act of erasing the hadiths and traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi after his departure. We also mentioned that there was a group and a campaign that we called it the campaign of Hasbuna Kitabullah that we only need the book of Allah that started at the moments or the days of the departure of Rasulullah when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi was ill and on his deathbed and it continued from the ruling of the first ruler upon the Muslims Abu Bakr to the second ruler Umar ibn al-Khattab and it continued within the Muslims or those who be with the government or with the rulers or as they mention the emirs or the sultans so those who actually worked with the emirs or the sultans they were the ones who destroyed the hadith erased the hadith as we mentioned the hadith the abdullah bin umar erased the tradition of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi in a bucket of water today in this episode we will also mention how at the ruling of Umar ibn al-Khattab, not only it was prohibited to narrate the hadiths of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, but it was also prohibited for a person or a Muslim to conduct one of the sunnah and traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. It was prohibited for them to pray, for them to make tawaf, to go around the Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we mentioned in the story of the prohibition of prayers of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, that even mandatory prayers, the five daily prayers were also prohibited. So our dear brothers and sisters, stay in tune with us as we continue our talk in what occurred at the time of the second ruler and the rulers that came after the departure of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. If we deeply look into the heritage of some schools of thought within the Muslims, we notice that the words and the principles or policies of Umar actually started to become hadiths of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. For example, his policies were that if there was a hadith from the Prophet that did not mention anything of the Qur'an, then those who carried those hadiths, they should erase those hadiths and get rid of those hadiths immediately. And if we look at Musnad Ahmad, the book of Musnad Ahmad, volume 3, page 12, we see that these hadiths also refer back to the Prophet. That the Prophet says, if you find a hadith from me that has nothing to do with the Qur'an, erase this hadith and get rid of this hadith. Even though we as Muslims, we believe that Rasulullah was the translator of the Qur'an. And the Qur'an holds every single knowledge and every single aspect of life. So if the Prophet speaks of, of, of things that are not directly mentioned in the Qur'an, does this mean that it was not of the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? But these hadiths also came into the books of the Muslims referring that Rasulullah 
said that if the Quran is not mentioned in the hadith, then get rid of this hadith and destroy this hadith and erase these hadiths. And this continued, this continued in the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And then even if we look at some books and the same book by Taqid al-Ilm al-Khatib al-Baghdadi uh, in page 54, we'll see a hadith uh, of two individuals by the name of Abdullah bin al-Aswad wa that they went to the house of Abdullah bin Umar, Abu Rahman. And they, and they had gathered in the hadith, it mentions that they had found a book of hadith that contained hadiths uh, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi and from his household. The hadith mentions that Abdullah bin Umar was asleep, so they sat at the doorsteps of Abdullah bin Umar until he woke up. And then his servant or maid came at the door and she saw that these two individuals were sitting at the doors of his house. And they told her that we have brought this book. It contains very beautiful hadiths and traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And we would like to share these traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi with Abdullah bin Umar. So she goes up to Abdullah bin Umar and she tells him that these two individuals are at your doorsteps and they have brought a book to share with you. So they go and sit with Abdullah bin Umar and they apologize for coming to him at a late time. Abdullah bin al-Aswad wa alqama and alqama and they tell him the story is such and such. We have found a book that contains very beautiful hadiths from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi directly. And uh, the next thing that happens, Abdullah bin Umar tells his maid or servant to bring a bucket of water. Because you know at the time, they used ink and they used to write on scrolls. The hadith says, or this documented occasion of history says that Abdullah bin Umar started to dip these scrolls and hadiths of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi into the bucket of water and start to remove and erase the hadiths of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And his response to them was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given us stories in the Quran and the Quran is enough. Again, going back to the campaign that started by his father, Hasbuna Kitabullah. And of course, this opposition, this opposition of stopping and bringing the sunnah and the tradition and the name of Rasulullah to an end did not stop only with compiling hadiths and tradition of history of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, but actually persecuting those who lived by the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. For example, we see that those who used to pray the nafila, the recommended prayers, after Salat al-Asr, after the Asr prayers, the Umar himself would prosecute them and he would beat them severely with his own hands. With his own hands. If they lived by the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, people like Abu Ayyub al-Ansari refrained from the sunnah throughout the ruling of Umar until the time he departed. And when he was asked why, his response was, didn't you see that he would beat people by his own hands and he would prosecute them by his own hands. If someone prayed the recommended prayers after us prayers, if you refer back to the book of Abdul Razak al-Sanani, 
you will see that several people have given this hadith that they witnessed with their own eyes that people prayed the nafila after Asr prayers and that Umar persecuted them himself with his own hands and he would beat them himself. For example, as Sa'ib bin Yazid, Abi Sa'id al Khidri, Zir ibn Hubaysh, and Abu al Ghadiyah. These individuals give us hadiths and occasions in the book of Abdul Razak al Sanani, which is a Sunni scholar, that Umar persecuted personally those who prayed the Asr Nafila, which was the Sunnah and the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And his excuse was when he was asked that why did you start to persecute those who merely lifted the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This is something that our beloved Prophet used to do in his lifetime. His response was that I fear, he feared that the Muslims would stay in the masjid praying until the time of the Maghrib. So he persecuted them personally so that they, they, they stopped from praying and refrained from prayers. Now, as Muslims, is this a legitimate reason for someone to prosecute the Muslims? That they stand before Allah and they give two units of prayers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they establish a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it did not stop at prayers. Even when it came to tawaf, going around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Kaaba, it is recommended that when a person goes to the city of Mecca and he enters Masjid al-Haram, it is recommended that a person does tawaf and goes around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seven times in hadiths that this is a prayer itself and it needs the same laws of any normal salat and prayer meaning you need wudu you need purity to enter the state of tawaf around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he started persecuting those who would make more than one tawaf per day for his reason was that I fear that the Muslims will lose will lose respect for the house of Allah and the house of Allah will no longer have its blessings or holiness these were the excuses that this man made in destroying the tradition of Rasulullah the commandments of Allah the laws of Allah and this religion, the religion of Islam. And if you refer to back Kitab Tarikh al Khamis, you will find that this story is mentioned that people who made more than one tawaf per day, they were persecuted by Umar ibn al Khattab. And as we mentioned, in the previous episode, that a person like Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman mentions himself that we cannot even pray our five daily prayers in public at the time and the ruling of this man. Now brothers and sisters, I hope you're enjoying this show, the past several episodes, and please continue watching this show the Master of Messengers with me, Mudaffar Al-Qazwini. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.